what's monitoring? I don't want to scare you in the morning, but perhaps wake you up a little bit. Um, so it, there's no default to say what is monitoring. So I try to explain what monitoring is for me. It means the basic foundation, I guess, for monitoring is availability and functional monitoring. It means if, I, if I'm not able to ping a device or a service or something else, I have no idea what's going on and if, what the performance is, what the metrics are. So it means figuring out um, if your infrastructure is available, if your services are available, and if they are basic, let's say, functional, if you can log into the database, for example, that's the foundation of everything coming on later. On top of that, metrics and time series. Metrics and time series are very popular, especially in the last three or four years, with starting with graphite. Um, previously, where there were things out, RD tool, MRT key, and all this stuff, but it was never so people were never so interested in metrics, and it, it changed a lot in the last year, so this is a big topic for me. And also logs and events. Um, means um, tools together, information out of systems, dealing with um, submitted logs and that. And another a very important thing for me is user experience. means it doesn't help you in any way if, if all your checks are, are super green and everything is okay, but the user experience is bad, and the, your user is not able to use the web interface or a fed client application. So getting kind of a perspective how your application is served to users is also important, I think. So what to monitor? Um, when we visit customers, when we are in projects, it's, it's, it's sometimes really not hard to figure out what should we monitor. So that's, that's really a hard question. What is important for me? So there are different approaches to, to come to a full-featured monitoring. I would say if you have no idea how to start, the best way is to to focus on your business. So what, what are the services you're making money with? Internally or externally? Not so important, but what's the important service? What drives your business? And to achieve that, I think a top-down approach for monitoring is very helpful. It means bottom-up means you monitor every device you can, you can find, do an auto-discovery, and every IP address you get in a successful reply is monitored, but it doesn't help you. It ends that you get 2,000 emails in your mailbox, and you will probably spend half of your day creating rules to move them to the trash. Um, therefore, a top-down approach is really very helpful. So first of all, focus what is your business logic. So what, what, what are you doing? Um, the funny thing is some people don't know what they are doing. Um, I meet a lot of customers where they say, what are you making money with? So, yeah, that's hard to say. So then you have a problem. So you should know what you're making money with. Um, and then starting with the business logic, starting with external service which your customers use, which your customers are unhappy with if they are not running, is a very good point to start. Then focus on the application. means if you have an external web service or you have a, a web shop or something like that, then figure out what applications are responsible that your business logic is up and running. means it could be one application, it could be more applications ending up that you have a su successful service um, of your business logic. Underneath of that, they are services. means, for example, um, a Tomcat, a database, whatever could be needed for an application to be up, and then you come to the business logic on top of that. And at the end, infrastructure is important as well. Um, of course, there are different perspectives on infrastructure because perhaps the, the guys are interested in, in a, I don't know, failed disk are not the same people are interested in, in a fail in the business logic. Perhaps your management is not interested in a hard, hard drive failure, but somebody should take care of, because if all your hard disk crash, then you have a problem in your business logic as well, a later point. So there are different perspectives, but definitely I would say a good point to start um, is going the, the top-down way. So how to monitor? So how to do it heavily depends on your perspective. Means what's important for you, what you like to see, um, is something nobody can answer for you. So the perspective on your infrastructure, on your services, um, could be so different that uh, depending on your employees, on your service guy who comes to your company tells you a totally different story. So there is no, no perfect rule to do it. One thing I heard a lot of times that people discussing monitoring is push or pull the best concept. Um, and I think there's no, there no or, there's an end. Because there are things, push makes sense, and there are also um, other events where, where pull makes sense. So there's no or for me, and, and to, to write this the same with Vim or XM is better, means there's no, perhaps there's a better one, I don't know, 
Um, but definitely there's a push and pull for me. So sometimes it makes sense to go to a machine and get out the metrics. On the other hand, it's, it's, it's also important to deal with passive events coming in. Metrics are sent the push way. Or for example, if, you, if you're dealing with SNM, SNMP threads, for example, they are still out there. And I think we, we are not going to kill them in the next 10 years. Personally, I don't like auto discovery. So auto discovery is very helpful in marketing uh, because you press a button, then you have 10,000 of green or red lights. But the quality in auto discovery environments is most of the time not very good. Because what do you have? You have a bunch of services you figured out existing in, in your environment, but perhaps it's a, a laptop, notebook, workstation, whatever. So it's really hard to make um, a good environment out of an auto discovery service. There are, there are some excludes for it, um, especially if you work in, in big network environments, auto discovery could make sense. So if you have a good tool, for example, OpenNMS, which is really good for, for telco, for big network environments, there's a very good auto discovery ability, also creating dependencies on that. There it could be helpful because creating, for example, dependencies on a network layer could be really, really hard work if you do it with infrastructure as code. But I would say in general, IT services infrastructure, definitely you should think about infrastructure as code. Means you have, you have a process where you define where your services are. Use a configuration management, if it's Puppet or Ansible, Salt, whatever. We have already something where you orchestrate your infrastructure, where you say that service should run of a bunch of machines and monitoring should be a part of it. So the time where you create all your services and then open up a ticket to the monitoring team and say, please take care of the monitoring, please don't do it. So monitoring must be a part of your life cycle that a service goes up, it has to be monitored. Also in the, in the early stage of a development, it should be part of the process that monitoring is an, an important part of that. And also if the service goes down, then it's gonna be removed out of the monitoring system. So infrastructure as code is, for me, the only thing to do it right with monitoring, that monitoring is part of your process because it re reduces failure rates, it reduces alerts on things, that are okay that they're not longer here. So definitely for me a good way. And also an important thing to choose the tool for you. So if you need that, you should know and, and you should figure out what tool can I configure with my favorite configuration tool. Provide monitoring as a service. If you have a monitoring, make sure that the other guys in your company, the other folks have a chance to, to work with that monitoring system. So provide API, interface, whatever, that they have a chance to participate in the monitoring and they are not required to open a ticket, write an email. It means mo monitoring should be a fundamental part of your infrastructure design and therefore you need something like a service interface, whatever you use, but monitoring needs to be a part of the process and that you can engage people to use it, you, you have to provide kind of a service. If you would like to have a service monitored, independent from if you are on duty or not, but use that interface, um, add your service here, and then we have it in the monitoring system, then you get your metrics, also create dependencies on that. So it means if you don't edit in the right way, you will not able to get metrics for your service. So that's an important fact. So, so coming in explaining what I think monitoring is and how a, a technical approach can work, let's talk about the tools, because this is why we are here, hopefully, in that talk. Talking about availability and functional monitoring tools. So what's out there? There are dozens of tools out there. I have, um, there's no reliable database what open source monitoring. So you can look on Wikipedia, there are about, I don't know, 64 tools. There's a monitoring survey, James Turnbull did for a couple of years. It's a little bit outdated since it's from 2015, um, but it gives a good impression what's out there. So he asked people on a, on a yearly basis usually what are you using, what are you doing with your tools, and um, what's important for you. And, and in the tools of I, you can see that Nagios is still number one. Um, then there are a couple of star services like CloudWatch, New Relic, some homegrown tools, whatever that means. Usually it's a modified Nagios or something like that. Then Asynca is coming up, Sensu, Subix, and all these tools which are from the open source on-premise area here, I will talk about, except OpsView, and Centrium because they are kind of flavors of Nagios and I don't want to cover it again. They are, of course, individual products with advantages and disadvantages, but it's also not possible to put it in the, in the, in the 45 minutes talk. So I will focus on the, on the open source on-premise tools um, in this survey. So 
So what they are? Nagios, Lysinga, Sensu, Subix, Freeman, and OpenNMS. Perhaps you figured out that OpenNMS is not in the survey, but I think it's worth mentioning it, so I put it in. Let's talk about the first one. Um, it's kind of a love-hate relationship. I was using Nagios for, 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 yeah, for years. I was in the Nagios Community Advisory Board once. Um, and the problem is I think Nagios is a good system. And, but Nagios was a good system at this time, like steam machines were cool at some time. So Nagios has a lot of advantages and it is easy to extend and all that stuff, but definitely today I would say they are better alternatives. So of course you can use Nagios still for, if you have to monitor 20, 30 hosts. And, and Nagios still is really, really reliable because the code base is so old and so many people patched it to death that it really works. Um, but there are better options out there. So I'm not an Argus hater to make that clear, but if you, if you start new, if you think about doing something with monitoring, please don't start with Nargus. Start with anything else, but not with it old part where there's no active development in it. Sorry, Nargus, somebody's here. Um, I think too. The other one on the list, um, also that I'm involved on the Isinga project, we have pros and cons as well, and I would, would like to, to treat every product fair. Um, Isinga tool came out of the Nagus fork originally, so the Isinga project forked the Nagus 3 code base into Isinga, but at some point we figured out at this time that it was really hard to, to enhance the code base, and then the product, uh, the team started to rewrite um, the code from scratch in C++. Um, advantages definitely in Isinga are that there are a lot of integrations to other tools are built in. Means if you want like to write metrics to graphite, influx DB, open CCB, all this stuff, it's just a feature you need to enable. Means you don't need Gravios or some other external tools to make that happen. It has an application-based cluster stack, and it's really cool to automate it because it has a REST API. Means the REST API um, to add, delete, modify services during runtime um, makes it very easy to have it in an HL environment, and that's definitely an advantage. And this advantage could be in Isinga because there are so many possibilities to have active, passive checks and have the checks running on the server, on the client, that it could be complex to set up. Especially if you have your, um, a system with multiple nodes um, or the certificate thing we need to make it secure and all that stuff, people have sometimes problems with it. Um, always room for improvement, of course. The documentation here is not so bad, but but we regularly figure out that people have problems with so much possibility. Talking about Sensu, Sensu has in general a very similar approach like Nagus and Isinga. They also have kind of standalone and subscription checks means the server can do stuff and also the client can do stuff. Um, a lot of people complaining about RabbitMQ which is necessary to run Sensu. I'm not a RabbitMQ expert, but if you look at the forums, a lot of people complaining that it's not running, it's not stable, and it's hard to install. I don't want to charge on RabbitMQ because no, I have no idea, but this seems to be a problem if you're running sensor in production that people often have a problem um, with the uh, transport layer in there. Um, there are no historical data. If you would like to do SLA reporting afterwards, it's really hard in sensor because the information is there in logs, but you don't have a data model to access it. And what's really sad is that all Sensu moved to enterprise only. Means dependencies, for example, there are no dependencies in the open source version. Um, SNMP moved to the enterprise version. It's not wrong to have an enterprise version. Don't get me wrong, but I don't know where is the, the border between open source and enterprise version here. I think the open source version of Sensu is really hard um, because it, it's probably not enough for an enhanced monitoring setup. If you're able to buy the enterprise stuff in addition to that, then it will pretty much do everything you need. Um, but this is something you should take care about. Subix. Um, Subix is also a very, very popular monitoring tool. I think in Japan, for example, it's de facto standard. So a lot of people using Subix there. Perhaps you know better, but I, I heard so that, that Subix is very popular there. It's a full-featured solution. With Subix, an advantage definitely is you get a lot of out of the box. You install the agents turn them on and you get all the data, you get your graphs, everything. So it's really easy to start up your monitoring system. Um, logging and graphing is integrated in Subix, that is, that is easy. It's a little bit harder to orchestrate and automate. But it's usually the case with all the tools. As much you get, when you get more in upfront, then it's 
usually harder to extend it later words because all the things are integrated. If you would like to extend it in some way, then it's, it's really not that easy. And scaling subix could be a problem because subix, also the, the satellite systems relay on a Postgres database, uh, but at the end, all the data has to be written in a single Postgres database. To be fair, also other problems like you think I have the issues working on that, but that's a scale of limitation. I know that customers have with subix, if you would like to scale out that your database um, needs to be very good suited, it means you definitely need SSD in a large environment to, to deal with all the data coming from subix. Riemann, anyone heard of Riemann? Okay, a couple of you. Um, Riemann is a, is a project, it's, there's not so much going on, it's my last point on the, on the slide, but I figured that out that there's not much going on in the project right now. Riemann is a streaming processor, it means you have a server running and all the clients con constantly push um, streams to the server. It's based on Clojure, which is really important to, to know that it's in Clojure because you also have to write your streaming rules in Clojure. It means you have to be familiar with that language to really work with Freeman in a good way. Um, if you would like to measure different things like a web server, application server, they provide different Riemann tools to send over the metrics to the Riemann server. It's stateless, means it, it doesn't store any data, it just handles it, shows it in, the, in a web interface, and you can see the metrics. So the advantage of Riemann definitely is also perhaps in a combination with another monitoring tool that you really have real-time information about your system. So you get constantly get your performance streams out of the system and see what's going on. But like I said before, um, there's not so much going on in the project. I checked um, GitHub again yesterday. There are a couple of small documentation enhancements, but there's no much to do. On the other end, it could be that it's just perfect right now. There's no much to do. I cannot, I don't know. OpenNMS. Um, OpenNMS is on the market also for, for a very long time. Um, it's also a full-featured open source solution, means you have everything in there. It's very good in auto discovery, like I told you before, it's very good in hetero, in homogeneous environments, um, telco, network, they are very strong in that area. Um, it's based on Java, which is not important to say if you hate or love Java, but it's hard if you fork out of Java. It means every time you leave the OpenNMS Java context, if you have to execute an external plugin, then performance is horrible. They have a lot of stuff included, it means SNMP, everything is inside the JVM and it's pretty fast, but if you have to leave the JVM because you have to do something which is not included into OpenNMS, then performance is not so good. But this is not a, it's kind of an OpenNMS problem, but it's a Java problem. Forking out of Java is expensive, um, and therefore scaling out external checks with OpenNMS doesn't make sense, but I also guess that's not their field of expertise. Um, yeah, auto discovery is, is really cool, they are also Really, really nice guys from the OpenNMS project. I know them for years. Um, it's definitely a cool tool if it fits to your, to your needs. Okay, so leaving the, the functional monitoring, let's assume we, we set everything up using our favorite tool. We, we figure out something is running or is not running. Metrics and time series, what it's all about, counting. So we would like to say, perhaps it ends up in money or not, but we would like to know how the metrics are. Um, and definitely, I would say, biggest player here is Graphite. So, not talking about all the RD tool based um, tools which are out there, MRT, PNP, whatever. Um, so, RD is definitely also a very cool thing. The problem with RD is for most of the people, it's not fancy enough. Um, that's not a technical argument, I know, but sometimes you don't need technical arguments. Um, and that's definitely a problem that people would like to have more fancy graphs where you can add different and all that stuff, and that's hard with RD. So what Graphite is, um, the database underneath the Graphite is the WhisperDB is very similar to RD. It has a couple of differences. For example, you can you can also add data uh, not in a in a serial fashion like like PNP. The the dates have to be arranged. That is not necessary for the WhisperDB. Um, it kind of started the metrics revolution. So it really started to be popular, I would say, four years ago, something like that. Um, and the biggest advantage is also the biggest disadvantage because um, Graphite consists of different components. You have the Whisper, which is the database for the RDs. You have a Carbon. You have um, 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 a Graphite Web. 
And some of the original components are, first of all, are really hard to install. So a lot of people fail with Graphite because they're never able to get it up and running. Um, but also the different components, and it's scaling very good. And means if you, if you look out at GitHub, there are so many different components replacing individual components of Graphite. Uh, for example, Carbon Zipper, which is like a proxy for the carbon cache. There are so many things that it's, it's really like a moving target. Um, and it, it could be hard to debug. Um, I know that there are a lot of lo large environments based on graphite and they figured how to deal with it, but to start with it and scale with it, 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 it needs some knowledge, I would say. Definitely, it's, it's, it's still kind of the standard, I would say. Another thing is OpenTSDB. Anybody using OpenTSDB? Oh, congratulations, you made it. Pardon? Ah, okay. So OpenTSDB is pretty cool, but it's hard to set up because it's based on Hadoop and HBase. means you have to know how that shit works. And if you know it, congratulations, you know it. Um, then you can do it. It's, 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 it. it's really able to scale like crazy. Um, you can also store all your data. You don't have to reduce your data. You can, you can live with the raw data forever if you're able to, to pay for the disks, of course. Um, and it's if it's up and running, it's very easy to scale. I mean, based on the H base and Hadoop, you just add a node and, and that's it. Um, it's very powerful. Um, it's also um, a lot of monitoring tools provide um, an API to OpenTSDB. So if you already have knowledge about a Hadoop or H base or already have a cluster, that, that would be a good point to start. Um, if you just would like to start with metrics um, and then have to start with Hadoop and H base, if you have time, good. Anyway, it's, it's, a, it's harder to start with OpenTCB. Another thing gaining more and more attention is Prometheus. And Prometheus originally was developed by a Berlin-based company named SoundCloud um, for the internal metric storage. They open sourced it, and I think since about a year, I don't know, they're a member of the Cloud Native Foundation. Um, Prometheus is also a time series database with an with a three-dimensional model, means the, the database model is not tree-based, like in, in, in Graphite, for example, you have these tree-based metrics, and Prometheus is very flexible in the database model. Um, originally, it's designed for, for, for web service. You can query externally, means getting OS metrics or something like that, you need other tools installed to be. There was no kind of a plug-in mechanism on there. Um, for example, you would like to get some load information or infrastructure information, you need a node exporter, install it. And what, what made Prometheus very powerful, that it has a, a rule-based alerting. So there's a component in Prometheus named Alert Manager, where you can, based on metrics and thresholds, create alerts, send it to a user. And if you, are, if you have a setup that is really based on metrics, and probably all your, your information comes out um, of, let's say, response time and, and specific load um, scenarios, then Prometheus is really good to, to set up a monitoring based on metrics. It has to fit your environment. Um, definitely in, in all that, in that, in that cloud area means because also Kubernetes is in the Cloud Native Foundation. It gains a lot of um, attraction, um, heavily developed moving forward. So it's definitely interesting tool to check in the next years. Another thing is InfluxDB. Um, InfluxDB has a very similar scope to Graphite. I think it, the first hand would say, okay, let's make Graphite easier. Um, therefore, it's, it's really much more easier to install. And it has a very powerful SQL-like query language. So if you're familiar with SQL, you, it's really, really easy to get metrics out of Influx. Um, the, the cool things, need enterprise also, means um, horizontal scale out in InfluxDB, you need to pay for it. Um, and they put a lot of energy in, in also doing more with it means they developed a stack named TIC stack. Um, TIC is for Telegraph, Influx, um, what is it, Chronograph and Capacitor. Um, there are different components uh, where Telegraph is able to send metrics to InfluxDB, um, Chronograph is the web interface to analyze it, and Capacitor is something like the alert manager in Prometheus. So the guys from, from Influx Data figured out that they probably have more than a metrics database and created components to have probably the full chain from sending metrics to InfluxDB, have a web interface analyzing it, and also creating some, having a rule-based approach 
um, to get alerts out to the user. Elastic, I would say it's the de facto standard. So who's using Elastic Stack in some way here? Definitely more than OpenTCB. Um, don't ask me why. I would say they were the first player and they, they have made very good decisions in buying other projects. Means Elastic Search is there for a couple of years based on, um, um, on Lucene. Um, and the Elastic Stack also started in the time series era about very serious, I would say, one and a half years ago. Um, there's a Kibana extension named Timeline for, for metrics and for time series. It's pretty cool. You have to look out. Um, Elastic Beats, which is a, a method to directly send metrics information from your tool. They are perhaps Beats for Isinga, for Nagios, for your, for your application server. You can directly send uh, metrics information to Elastic, bypassing Logstash. Um, and then you can use Kibana to query this. Um, it has a different model approach because uh, the fundamental concept of how Elasticsearch works in the database is different to the model of Prometheus or Graphite works. Um, and it's more important that you know at the beginning what you would like to see. Where the Graphite approach is more like put everything in and if you can afford it, store everything and look later what you need. Um, in Elastic, I would say you, you need to think more about what I would like to have metrics for how the, the node design should be, how the object design should be. Um, StatsD could be helpful. Um, StatsD in combination with Logstash, StatsD is kind of a metric aggregation daemon from Etsy where you can um, yeah, work with, 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 with counts and aggregate specific values and putting that information back in Elastic um, is very powerful, but it could help you in some way as well. So now we found out a way we can store in the metrics. Different of the tools have their own web interface, like um, the Influx data guys, um, Kibana, of course. But if you talk about visualization, so getting all the, the metrics out, Grafana is it. So Grafana is, I would say, right now the standard because it works with all these databases. Um, Grafana has um, interfaces to, to all these tools and more. Um, the guys um, working on Grafana Torgel and the, and the Grafana team, Rain Tank, um, they're bringing new releases, I would say, every week. And, and it, it, it's very easy to start with. And it's very easy, and that's probably one of the reasons why it's so many people using it, because it's easy to combine different data sources, also from, from different backends into a single panel. It means you get some sources out of InfluxDB from Graphite. If you have more of that, getting information about Elastic. Um, and it's a very cool thing. Who knows Grafana annotations? Not, not so many. So annotations are a cool way that if you have your graph and storing your metrics in it, something happened in your system, for example, a puppet run or usually a git commit, so somebody break, break your system, then you can show that event in your graph. It means you can probably look with Grafana into your metrics database and also look up to, to your syslog information and that's pretty cool because if you see that something is wrong with your performance, with your metrics, with the response time, sometimes um, it's just a puppet run. Exchanging some software is just a commit in your software. And the annotations make it very easy to see it. You can see, depending on the event here, it's just a, a test event. You can also add more information here. You can also say, there's a git commit by developer XYZ, so you can call him. So it's really easy to have a, a quick analyze if the performance changes what happened. So if you use Grafana and have kind of a log management tool in the middle, you definitely should give it a try. Talking about logs and events, um, first of all, we have to start, I think, what the difference between log and events are. So a log is just a flow of unstructured data. So hopefully we have kind of a timestamp, makes it important to work with it, but it's not more than we have a timestamp and we have a bunch of information in a log. And if we would like to do more with, with it, we have, to, we have to split it up in different attributes. It means going from a log into event means we have to check what is what. Um, what is the timestamp? What service is responsible? What is the message? Um, and it's, I would say it's always the same process, except you only have the, um, by law, you have to probably store your logs. Then perhaps you don't care what's in there if you don't have to store it. But if you would like to work with your logs, you have to make it into events. So the process should always be like going from a log to event, 
think about Logstash or Greylog, you, you have Croc, for example, you have different patterns where you can split up that log information into the different parts. Most of the services are already out there, so we don't have to rethink it again, just, just grab it. And then analyze it, and then take some action. Means if you really work with logs, you have first off create really the identify the attributes and work with it later on. Um, also, Elastic in in that area definitely is is more the standard than in the time series area. Um, it's it's highly integrated. So since Elastic at the time was was the first one, Elastic based on the scene, then they I don't know kind of bought or adopted Logstash, um, developed by Jordan Sissel, and then Kibana. So they get all these tools together, and, and also Beats was an, an external project named Packet Beats before. So Elastic did very well in getting the right components together in a, in a complete solution. That it was it now is the Elastic stack. It was previously the Elk stack, but since they added Beats, Elk doesn't work anymore. Um, you don't have any user authentication or stuff in it. And, and if you obviously would have everything in a fancy way, you need an XPEC for it. But how they do it, Elastic, I think it's, it's very good because, for example, Logstash has a very powerful API, which is an advantage to others. So you can really go to a Logstash instance and see what's going on, um, how the data is processed, how quick it is. And this is open source. If you would like to have it in a fancy way in your Kibana, you need to buy the XPAC. But I think the border they draw between open source and, and, and enterprise edition is pretty cool because you have everything. You have the APIs, you can access them. If you would like to need it in a more fancy, freeable way, you have to buy the XPAC. So definitely Logstash API came up with, um, I think, Logstash 5 a year ago, one and a half year ago. Um, if you're working with Logstash and you, you see some kind of processing performance problems, the API is very, very helpful. And by far, it's the largest community. So if you think about log management, all that stuff, Elastic is the biggest community. Another cool tool is Greylog. Um, Greylog is also based on Elasticsearch, so they use kind of the same database, um, but the dif biggest difference is that all the configuration and the ruling and everything where you have to do by hand in Logstash um, is provided by a graphical interface. Also, if something like authentication, authorization is important for you, Greylog could be a very good choice because everything is in there. Means um, go connecting to LDAP, having user rules, all that stuff um, is pre-built um, and it's easier to start with Greylog because you have an interface where you can see your input sources, your output sources, and it works also very good in combination with Logstash. Um, means you, it, it's, it's, it's always, it's not an, it's an or, it could, it could be an and as well. Means you can combine all these tools, and there are a lot of users using Greylog, but using, using uh, Logstash to get the information from the system. Or another tool named FluentD. FluentD, like uh, Prometheus, also joined the Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, it's, it's kind of a unified log layer. So I would say Fluent could be a replacement for Logstash. It has a very powerful log layer and connects various systems with others. Um, I have two minutes, you have nine minutes. What is correct? I only have ten minutes. Okay. I have the right time zone, hopefully. Uh, okay. Um, Fluent could be a good alternative to Logstash. Or if you, if you don't want to use Elasticsearch as a data store, if you use something else because Fluent is supporting multiple backends, um, Fluent is also a good point to start. Um, an advantage over Logstash could be that it has built-in reliability. It means it has, um, it has a file and memory-based buffer system where you can also replicate it to multiple Fluent services, which Logstash doesn't have. So um, it, it definitely could be a, a, a good man-in-the-middle replacement. User experience. Probably the, the last area which covered all the others. Um, I don't know who is, who is doing end-to-end -end monitoring in some fashion. Okay, we'll not have a lot of fans here, I guess. Um, it's not super popular. It means really figuring out how your browser works or how your Fed client works, not a lot of people doing it because it's a lot of work. Um, perhaps I would say for a typical ops guy, it's not so much fun to be with a front end and fill in different variables, but it's really, really helpful. So end-to-end -end monitoring gives, gives, you, gives you another experience that you don't have a disappointed customer. And it's really often the case that technically everything is right, but the user experience is shitty anyway. 
means not talking about a bad interface. That's another story. But just your interface doesn't work like expected. And therefore, um, for some services, for, for some, I don't know if you're talking about a web shop, going through your shopping experience, adding a product to the cart, doing a checkout, and, and checking if the, the invoice is correct, could make sense. Um, there were these tools out there, Web and Checked and Outed. They were cool a long time ago. Means they are really not actively development. Web, check, Web and Check, the last release was 2006. Still people using it. And Outed is also a little bit outdated. Also, the current Windows versions are not supported. Um, there are two end-to-end two -end user tools I would like to mention here. One is Sakuli. Sakuli is a combination of a tool named Sahi and one of Sikulix. One is for web testing and one is for fed client testing. Um, it's mainly for Nagios compatible systems, means Nagios, Isinga, Sentry, and Opsu, all that stuff. Um, most of the checks can just, you can just launch a Docker container, means it's, it's very much isolated, um, which I'm not really sure that some of the Sahi features are enterprise only. I have, you have to check out what you need here. Um, and another interesting product I think nobody knows here, I guess, is a product named Alivix. It's developed by an Italian company. Um, it's a, it's a complete solution monitoring um, web user experience, monitoring fed client. They have an, an IDE where you can really create test cases on end-to-end -end basis. Um, and they have a full audit trail, the notification system as well. Send you a screenshot, for example, if something is wrong. Um, definitely you should, you should have a look. So if end-to-end -end monitoring, if you would like to, to check your user experience, if you would like to see if your Citrix is working, they are also able to work with mainframe terminal. If that's your thing, I would say mainframe and DevOps. I don't know. It could work in some way. Um, anyway, if you have it, they can do it. They can also work with Java applets. They can do pretty much everything. Um, it's really cool. So the, con the conclusion. So if, if you go out of the talk, come back next week and say, did you learn anything? So what now? So your boss comes on Monday. Uh, perhaps he's not looking so bad as he or I don't know. Um, I'm sorry there's no best tool. And that was probably not the goal of the talk to say, choose that one. Um, I think it depends on what you need. Means there are kind of two different approaches. There's a monolithic way where you have tools that do a lot of out of the box, like SubX and OpenNMS. They have everything in there. You install the agents, you have graphing, locking, everything. Um, and if it's, if it's enough for you, then okay, because it's easy to set up. You don't have to deal with all the external components. Also, if perhaps your main focus is not not tech. So if you, if tech is important part, but you, not all the guys are in tech and you just won't like to have a monitoring, then it could be a good choice because you get something easily. If you need more, if you need to scale out, if you want also play with the newest fancy hot shit on the market, then a modular approach could be better. Means um, if you are a tech-driven company, if, you, if your ops are really up to date and would like to play with a new way, combining different tools together um, is the best way. So I prefer a modular approach um, on a tool chain because one thing is um, that sometimes also the monolithic approach is good enough, but the problem is at some point you see a new thing is coming up again. So there's a new metric system you would like to play with. And then going from a monolithic approach to a modular approach and say I would like to replace my integrated graphing solution with graphite whatever, it's hard. Means best is take your favorite tool, set up kind of a real life use case. So don't, don't test your local Linux box. So perhaps in addition, but play with the use case you have in the company. Play with the integration. So try to hook different tools together. Choose your favorite. Sometimes you are not able to make the best decision. Like in life, you can go through every argument, but sometimes it's just flip a coin. If you don't know, just start with one and figure out if you like it. And if you like it and if it does everything you need, then it's perfect for you. So I'm hopefully in time. Thank you very much for listening. Are there questions or are there time? Is there time for questions? Five minutes? Are there questions? Are you awake? Kind of? I didn't get the question, I'm sorry. Hello? 
Hello. Yeah, I was just curious why you didn't mention pager duty in this list. Um, because of open source. Open source. Okay. Um, pager duty is cool, like others, Victor Ops and, and all these tools, but it's, an, it's, but it's an external alerting service. Um, Victor Ops is also cool because they're using Isinga, I know. Um, no, it's an external service. Like a lot of other cool things in the software as a service market, of course, like New Relic or CloudWatch or Datadog, Librato, but this is for me focused on open source, possible on-premise tools, and therefore it's not part of it. Of course, I know that all these alerting external notifications, SMS voice, is a big part of a monitoring tool chain. Um, you can do it on your own with various solutions, but definitely PagerDuty is a good choice as well. More questions? There's somebody. Uh, this question is not related to the tech exactly, but uh, as I used both the open source monitoring landscape as well as the proprietary stuff. So, uh, in your opinion, how far ahead is something like Splunk Pager Duty compared to the ELK stack and everything? In terms of for a scaling tech driven startups? Yeah, that's a good question. Companies. So, if you name Splunk, Splunk is awesome if you can afford it. Um, Splunk is expensive like shit. So if you would like to store a lot of data, it's, it's really hard to afford it. So if you, if you say, money doesn't, I don't care, I would say go with Splunk. It's super easy, you can call somebody and, and scream at him, it doesn't work. Um, so Splunk is really, really good. But since you, you pay storage-wise, so you pay on the data you store, I think for me it's more alternative. What I see, a lot of customers go away from Splunk because, not because the tool is bad, because they're not able to afford it. It's really only a cost reason why people go away from Splunk. Um, pardon? In terms of the features, um, definitely Splunk is much easier to configure. So I would say Greylog is, is more the, the Splunk approach than Elastic because all the configuration from the input and output is, is able to done via web interface. Also enterprise integration to to also open source tool would provide enterprise add-ons like Puppet or Ansible works pretty good with Splunk. Um, Splunk is fast, and Splunk is also, also capable to probably work with, with every input, output necessary, so it's definitely a good tool. So I'm not into, into Splunk, so I, I cannot install it, I can work with it, I know in general what it is and what it, what it is able to do, but I would say it's, it's really just a money reason. Um, otherwise, a good tool. So like I said, if you can afford it, congratulations, it's, it's a good one. And not meaning it bad, so if somebody from Splunk is here, I'm, I'm open for discussions. You never know who's in the audience. More questions? Yeah, there's just time for only one more question, sorry. Uh, hi, uh, so we, we have discussed about many open source tools. So my question is, if we want to have like an activity tracing, uh, let's say, uh, use case, you, all my use cases in the y-axis. I'm talking about a visualization and a particular graph where all my use cases are in y-axis and all my microservices, one, two, three in the x-axis. So if I want to do something like a color-coded uh, activity tracing for each of my use case, which tool is the most suitable one? Color-coded on what space? It's uh, on the performance or? No, no, no. Uh, activity tracing. Suppose if I like, if I have like eight microservices mm -hmm. and they are, uh, eight microservices is just one for app, uh, UI and then one for the um, database, uh, the service that's talking to the database and then to my IoT devices. So I want to activity trace my use case. Suppose, uh, let's say I'm switching on my device. Yeah. So starting from my switch to the application. I want to activity trace it. So I want to uh, visualize a graph like that. So which of the tools that we discussed now which we, which will be more suitable for, to visualize that kind of a graph? I would say none of these tools. <laughs> um, so if you would literally go into application, mm -hmm. um, New Relic is very powerful. Um, means it has some requirements because you have to replace PHP or JVM with their stuff, but they, they are really able to go into it. There's an open source, um, I, can, I can tell you later, it's not part of the presentation, but there's also an open source alternative to New Relic. And we have these, um, where we really can see what's going in in your application and the combination of the user case coming from a service, 
what's happening in the database, I, I talk to you later. Because I have something, but in general I would say none of these tools are good for it. Visualization could work in all these time series databases, but they at the end just show a result of your previous work. Mm -hmm. um, I, I have something I, I can show you later. Okay, I'm here the, both today and also, like again, I mentioned before, I think I came on Saturday. Thank you very much and enjoy the conference. <laughs>